Welcome to Congressional Academy Live. I'm PGA Director of Athletics, Jason Epstein, and you're in for a real treat this evening with John Scott as he talks about wedge play. Before we get started tonight, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, just that we are open, we are back in action, we had a really nice day of golf today, uh, pretty full tee sheet, and we couldn't be more excited to be welcoming members back to the club. If you haven't gone over all of the kind of policies, procedures, and guidelines for our reopening during phase one, I encourage you to do that on the website, uh, not only to review the letter that was uh, sent yesterday, but there's a there's thorough information on everything you need to know about golf and the reopening and, and that. And if there's any questions, you go ahead and email us at golfstaff at ccclub.org. And we're also really excited to have tennis open as well. Uh, and then soon, come Monday, uh, we'll be sending out a note. We'll have some fitness classes and some outdoor uh, stuff for everybody and the members to participate in. So welcome back. Uh, we're going to get geared up and ramped up. And hopefully the trajectory here just keeps going up. Uh, and we find a new normal that is really close to the old normal and get you back to the golf club and all the things you love to do at the club uh, in, in the coming days. So without further ado, we've got our Mid-Atlantic PGA Teacher of the Year uh, and just an even better guy than he is a teacher, John Scott. Had a great time tonight. We enjoy it. Really quick, though, be remiss. If you have any questions, the whole purpose of coming on here, doing this, is like, forget about all what I said is if you've got questions, please text them in. The number was in the email that you got earlier, 505-795-1787. Uh, we want to make this interactive, so uh, go ahead and text them in. So, uh, Scott, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Jay. Um, good afternoon, Congressional. It's awesome to be back at the club, and we had an awesome day on the golf course today. He's got the golf course looking great, so hopefully the weather holds up and we can all get out there this weekend and enjoy it. Um, also in the email last along with Jay's number was um, a PDF file of a short game manual that I used for my short game classes. I um, it would be great if you guys could download it, save it to your phone on iBooks. Um, you can keep it on your phone forever. You can follow along in our, our lesson today. It could really help clear up some concepts if I go too fast in some of it. So it's on the um, email blast. Um, there's a link to it where you can just download it. So today we're going to go over two different types of wedges. So we're going to go over distance control wedges and um, your finesse wedges. So really different shots. Um, and we're gonna start with um, distance wedges. So anything outside of 50 yards, you can talk about here. So the first thing we need to do is talk about our equipment. So my equipment, I play four wedges. I go from a 48 degree lock or 46 degree lock club to a 50, to a 54 and 58. Is my Tennessee math serves me correct? That's four degrees of lock between each club. So what we're doing here, what we want is the same amount of lock between each club so we hit the ball um, solid more consistently. If you're hitting the ball shorter, if you're a shorter player, you might want to try a 52 to a 58 degree and have more hybrids or something like that at the top of your back. More often than not, you're going to see at least three or four wedges in your back. So I come up with a system that I teach most of my players, most of my competitive players for that matter, um, a system on how far back the club goes and how your body's working so we can predict how the ball is going to go. A system I call it's like a one-to-one, -one, a two-to-two, -two, or a full, similar to a, a box system. And I'm going to go through some of those positions today. So a one-to-one -one is a left arm parallel. I'm more concerned with where the hands are than the club is. So one-to-one -one on the back swing, two, and then a full. On the follow-through, right arm parallel to the ground, three-quarter finish, and a full. So our goal is to make the length of the swing match on each side of the swing. And then we can control the speed with our pivot. The best player, wedge players in the world, they're controlling their distance with their, with their pivot, with their torso. They're not using a lot of hands in the shot. So let's go through some of these factors here. The factors that are going to control how far we hit the ball is going to be the length of our backswing and how our follow through and our pivot are going to go. That's going to help control some of our swing and some of our launch characteristics. So the characteristics that um, help control where the ball is going to go is the loft of the club, the speed of our swing, the contact we hit it. Like if we hit it off the toe, the ball is going to come off slower. Hit it off the heel, the ball is going to come off at different speed. So the goal is to be able to hit it solid each time and predict where the ball is going to go. So the first thing I'm going to do when you come into a wedge play or a wedge class is we're going to create a couple baseline numbers. And I'm going to hit a couple shots. So I'm going to try to go with my 54 degree and go from a two to two wedge. And what we can see here, if you can see the track man on the top, 
As you can see, the miles per hour, that last one was 55. That was a little slow for me. I'm going to try to create the same swing speed and then create the same, the same swing length. And that's going to help create a baseline number for me. Once I hit two or three in a row that is in the same, um, within two or three miles per hour, then I know I'm kind of hitting on the right key. So a 60 miles an hour shot, that's perfect for me. My 54 degree, it's gonna go around 82 yards probably in the air on the golf course. So I know if, I'm, if I have anywhere in that number on the course, I can take a two to two backswing, a two to two finish, and I know I, I've practiced the, the speed of the swing enough. Just Scott, could you really quick go back and just show them like uh, face on what the one to one, two to two, and the three to three is, and just explain um, that one more time for me. Yeah, so a one to one is the length of my, where my left arm is on the back. So that's position one, position two, and position three would be a full shot. So note this is similar to a clock system, right? So a clock would be nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 30. I didn't like telling time, so I just picked one to one, two to two, and full, right? So one to one on the back swing. One to one on the follow through. So one to one, two to two, and pull. And if you really want to get fancy with it, if you have a chart, you can choke up. And, and then you can choke up and say a one to one is going to take two or three yards off. So it's very specific. To you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep going through my bag and I'm going to create baseline numbers to it. So once I know the big picture in terms of how the club should work, I'm going to work on some of the finer movements that control how I get this out. Some of my keys are. Um, if you tune into the last golf academy live, would be um, what my left wrist is doing through the ball. We need a significant amount of shaft length through impact to create a really solid contact, right? So significant amount would be like 10 or 12 degrees more forward at address than where we did at impact. Trackman's going to tell us our dynamic loft here. My last one had 39 degrees of dynamic loft. What that's telling us is my 54 degree just turned into a 439 degree. Loft wedge. So I'm gaining 14 degrees of loft. That's going to create a low launch and a low spin shot. So what I'm going to have players do is I'm going to have take take an alignment stick and I'm going to have them drag the alignment stick on the ground really slow until where the impact would be. And you can see how much shaft lean I would create with that. And drag it all the way to a full finish or to a one-to-one -one finish. What you're also going to see is my hands and my body move up as I do it. Somebody who adds a lot of loft to the club, they would look like this. They would throw the club first, and the club wouldn't stay on the ground very long. So if we know that we want to create less loft and impact, but we don't want to hit down on it a lot, we can stay really shallow and bring the handle of the club up and hit a low shot. I think one of the most misunderstood terms in, in wedge play would be you're attacking over your dynamic loft. If this, if this is, um, alignment stick is going to represent the ground, Many people think to hit down on it, the club would go down this way. That's a very steep angle of attack. You're going to hit a lot of ground here, and the ball's going to come off high off the face. You have no spin off the top of the face. What our goal is, is to stay level to the ground and feel like we're de-lofting it as the club is just skimming the ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this alignment stick, and I'm going to go a little faster now, drag the club on the ground, feeling the grip pull up. My body's nice and tall. I'm going to feel the emblem on my glove rotate, arch, and then almost turn to the ground when I'm done. From this angle, that way. What I don't want is adding loft to the club and this left wrist getting cut through the ball. Justin Scott, this applies to the one to one, two to two. Control, all right? distance control lifts, all and distance this, control lifts. And you talk wedges, when you talk 46, uh, 50, 54, uh, 58, or 60, that, that 46 is a strong pitching wedge. Correct. And, and, and you're talking for all four, right? Correct. Correct. This is for all distance, any, pretty much any shot. If you want to hit a six iron blower, that's the same field. We know, like, we want to hit these wedges low, so the ball's coming off the spin, and then we're going to control it. Just. So I'm going to create that thought with the alignment stick. I'm going to make small back swings, feeling like I'm pulling the club up and then flexing my wrist. So this is going to be just short of a one to one as a drill. And it's going to create less of a hand release and more of a body release to the swing. And you can see if, if the track name picks it up, the dynamic loft numbers are going to start getting lower and lower. So I know I'm onto something like that. Once you get that concept down, then we're going to go to the one to one backswing, feeling the same impact position that we just learned, a one to one, feeling the grip pull up, my chest pulls up, and a one to one finish. 
we're going to create really, really good spin and really good distance control. So again, the factors that, that tell you how far the ball is going to go, it's going to be the loft of the club you're going to hit, the length of the swing. We want a, a, to keep the length of the swings constant and the speed constant. That's going to give us a lot of predictability. I'd say one of the, the most common things I see when people are, are in between clubs or trying to control their distance, what they do is they take the, the one more club because they're afraid of coming up short. Like think of a, a hole with water on it, shot over a pond. They're going to take one more club and make this long and slow swing now that they have too much club. That could be some of the worst advice you can get. I'd much rather you have a shorter swing, control the loft of the club and hit it with your pivot rather than this long and slow swing. Okay. So those are the, the factors that that control your distance. I think one of the cool shots um, that I can teach you tonight is one of the, the cool shots you can hit in golf is the recipe for a high spinning wedge shot. Um, what we, we've gone over some of the parameters here, but I want to walk you through and hit some with our track man running and see if we can create a lot of spin with some of the shots, okay? So I'm going to work on um, a 2 to 250 40 degree wedge. What I'm going to try to do here is get the spin to be over 8,000 RPM. So my stock one on my last one was around 6,000 RPM. A PGA Tour player like Jason Duffner or a Zach Johnson. I thought you were going to say Jason Epstein. That's the <laughs> They're going to get that around 9,000 RPM. So let's see how I can do it. So I'm going to make a two to two back swing. I'm going to try to feel like I'm creating some chap lane and I'm de lofting the club through impact. Let's see how I can do it. Wow, 82 from the first try. 82 RPM. That's pretty good for me. So when we understand what creates a good impact position, we are able to repeatedly hit the same shot and create some spin. The one thing I can tell you that's really important with our wedges is how clean the grooves need to be. When I was caddying in the US Open this, this year, every time I had to clean the club, I had to clean the grooves, and then I had to clean the, the, the face and wipe it down with a wet towel. What happens here is the grooves don't spin the ball. The grooves, the, the job of the groove is to get debris out of off the face. What spins the ball is the milling in between the grooves. It makes it more important that you have fresh grooves when you play. So I have rusted wedges that's only for the glare because when I when I play, I don't like the, the, the sun beating down on, on the glare on it, especially when you're in a bunker and you open the wedge up. Can't stand that. So I use rusted wedges, but you've got to have clean grooves to spin the ball. So that's probably on, on these eight parameters is probably the most important one that you can use. Every shot you would see somebody hit on the, on the practice team on a PGA Tour event, they're cleaning the groups after every shot. So smash factor on here is telling me center, center contact. So what I'm gonna do is use my spray again, and we're gonna use the spray to see where I'm hitting it on the club face and what that does to the spin numbers. So again, I'm trying to hit an 80 yard shot, I'm going to purposely hit this one on the toe, and we're going to see the spin numbers come down. 5,600. So same club head speed. Smash factor went down from 1.0. Smash factor is ball speed divided by club speed. And you can see how far off the toe I hit it. I'm going to come, the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm going to come back to this a little bit later and use that shot to our advantage. Okay. Oh, Scott, one of the things that we talked about uh, last time you were on Academy Live here was the, the hands coming through the ball and up. And I think it's, how much are the hands involved in this? You, you said something earlier about the body, mm -hmm. really the body's turning it. Um, you, you know, it looks like you're putting a lot of effort and it, very, it looks very easy, but you're not really doing too much with your wrist or hands here, right? When the way your wrists work, if I can get them in flexing, it's gonna make influence my body pivot. because so I'm gonna be able to hold off and break the club. When the club hit, when I start doing this with my wrist, there's nothing to stop the club, so my body stops. So when my wrist flex, I'm able to turn, and it's gonna, I know I'm giving my hands a job, but the influencer on the hand is gonna get the pivot to work. So if you just go through impact real quick and just look, show, show the hands real close, what the hands should do coming through. They would be flexing, the grip's in front of the club head, I'd be pulling up with my lower body, and the grip is in front of the club head, and then I would follow through. You get a nice shallow dip. You don't Correct. Get yeah, so again, like, what people think they need to do to hit it solid is hit down on it this way. X creates an angled attack that's so high that it's going to run into the ground and you hit it off the top of the club. No different than I just hit it off the toe. The ball doesn't spin up here. The ball like tumbles, it actually releases. So when you need a shot that spins, you actually need to be really shallow. And the, the, the most spinning shot of golf is going to be almost low off the face, not high off the face. 
So another drill I like to get um, you to do to influence how the body works is hitting with the towel on your arms. Um, I'm, I put it behind my back like this, so it doesn't get in the way. Grip it right under my armpits, and I'm going to try to hit the same two to two shot, keeping the towel under my arms the whole time. So if my body slows down in the shot, my governor, the pop, your pivot is the governor of the swing. If my body slows down, the towel is going to drop, and my hands are going to pass the club head. My hands are going to start passing the club head at that point. So I have the players hit with the towel under their arms. Get their weight a little bit more on your front foot. Try to create a little shaft lean and hit some shots. So you have some different parameters to work for with your distance control weights. So the first thing that you should be doing is create a baseline number, create a favorite number. So for me, it's always a, a two to two shot. Very rarely are you gonna see um, wedge players, lay, like the old adage of laying up to a full shot or just laying up to 100 yards. 100 yards happen because a 56 degree wedge would go around the 100 yards like a full one would. But if you're going to create spin, you want to have a shorter swing and a faster swing and take off the, off of the club and spin off and put spin on the ball. So create a two to two distance where the back swing matches the follow through. Create less dynamic lofted impact. Make sure the toe of the club is releasing a little bit and you're holding off the club a little bit. That's going to create low launch and low spin. The ball is going to come back and dance around. Those are some of the factors for distance control. You get your, your two to two first, work around that, and if you get really, really fancy with it, you're in between clubs, choke up and hit the same length swing. Or, you know, maybe just go an inch shorter than a two to two, and you'll, you'll hit so many different numbers. If you're doing it right, you can get this all the way down there. So, so that's like some basic 50, um, so, excuse me, some basic distance control wedges. So I'm gonna switch gears now, and we're gonna go into our finesse wedges. I'm gonna use my 58 degree here. Now let's start with uh, the equipment again. The thing you got to look at for equipment is the grind of your club is more important than the bounce, okay? So I'm using a 58 degree. It has 11 degrees of bounce, meaning that's the angle from the bottom of the club on each side from the leading edge to the back. That's the bounce, that's where they measure it. But the number is kind of ambiguous because I have a lot of heel relief on my club. It's shaved down. So the grind is more important than the actual bounce. I like to open the club face up on tons of my wedge shots. So when the, the reason it's, it's grind back there, ground back there, is when I open it up, it sits down and it doesn't look like the middle of the ball is going to hit the leading edge. If you don't like to open up the club face, get something with more of a round bottom, like Tidal's makes the K grind. Um, you can get a 58 degree um, with TaylorMade that's got 12 degrees bounce or 14 degree bounce with a big bottom to it. So the, the, the equipment's really, really important here. So, we're going to go over two different shots in your finesse wedges, a pitch and a chip. Okay, so we've all had this lesson growing up. When I get it around the greens, the ball is back in my stance. I create this, this angle and this shaft lean. That's probably some of the worst advice you can get when you're chipping. What that does, it creates a lot of shaft lean. And we just learned if we want to spin the ball a lot, and we want to hit it fast and, and we'll come low coming off the base, we want shaft lean. But our goal when we're around the green, we don't want the ball coming off fast. We want it coming off slow and stopping. The shot that spins the least in your bag is a flop shot. That ball goes up, bounces once or twice. It's stopping because of angle of descent, not because of spin. So why would you set up to it with a lot of shaft lean and expect to control how the ball's going to come off the system? It doesn't make sense. So what I like to do, and we're going to start with a chip first, is you're going to set up with the ball in the middle of your stance. You can see the, the jacket. I wore the jacket on purpose. It, it, it's like a necktie. You can, it's a great reference point for the center of my sternum. It's always going to be in front of the ball. I'm going to tilt my left shoulder down a little bit, rotate towards the target, and then set up to the ball. So now what happens is I can play a neutral ball position, but my sternum is in front of the ball. The best wedge players and the chippers, what they're going to do is they're going to get control where the club hits the ground the most consistently. This is going to give you the most chance, the best chance to hit the most amount of shots from a neutral position. When I see players get the ball back like this, this is what they end up looking like. Now my, you can see my upper body is leaning back. My right shoulder gets really low from the down the line angle. You can see creates tons of angles with that. So again, to repeat it, the ball is in the middle of your stance, standing up nice and tall, hold my arms out. Left shoulder down, so I tilt. I rotate towards the target, so now I'm open. I hinge over at my waist. That's the setup for a basic chip shot. Keep your hands centered to your body. Keep your hands centered with your body. Eliminate excess shaft. 
what we want to do here is we want to create a place where the club's going to hit the ground so we can release the club this way. So it's just swinging this way back and forth. And wherever I move my sternum is going to control where the club hits the ground. If I move my sternum more forward, the club's going to bottom out later. If I move my sternum more back and I do that, yeah, the club's going to bottom out back there. So now my incentive becomes I'm going to have a better setup position and instead of creating this shaft wing, I can hit a high, medium, or low shot off of this setup. Okay. So when you're hitting a chip shot, some of the, the keys for hitting a chip, I call a chip like a left hand dominant shot. Because when we're done, we don't want the club passing our hand. Wherever the angle is at address, I'm going to return it there to impact. And there I am when I'm done. We don't have any conscious wrist angles, shaft lean, um, pulling on the grip. Wherever I set the shaft at address, impact, follow through. And then I'm nice and tall. One of uh, another misconception in chipping is you gotta keep your head down, you gotta keep still. Where the best wedge players in the world, they're hitting the ground and they're standing up when they're done. It gives you a lot of feel. Like if I were gonna toss you a ball, I wouldn't toss it and stay fixated in a position. I would hit the ground and I would stand up nice and tall. So basics for chipping 101 would be making sure I'm in the right setup position. My left shoulder down, chest is in front of the ball, tilt. And then from here, I would just take swings back and forth where the club's hitting the ground, and then I stand up. With the chip, the club that is always below your hands when you're done, you're nice and tall, weights on my front foot, this way. You can hit any chip shot with that. Now, with a pitch, things get a little bit different because the club is going to travel a little bit different, and the result of our shot, what we want is going to come up high and soft and probably fly. 25, 50 to 60% and roll 40 to 30% on the ground. So a little bit wider stance. Again, now we're, we're, we're gonna open the club face a little out of dress. Always open the club face and then grip the club. Never twist your grip this way first. So open the club face, grip the club. Tilt my left shoulder forward or down, rotate forward and set up to the ball. So now my stance gets wider. My sternum is still gonna dictate where the club hits the ground. That's even with the ball, not in front of it because I need the ball to launch a little bit higher. And that's your setup for a chip. The club head now is going to go higher than my hands on each side of my swing, higher than my hands on each side of the swing. When you're hitting a pitch shot, the club face always stays open to your target. Okay. So when we go back to uh, our, our spray to show where the, the ball is hitting off the club face, when you get really skilled at hitting pitch shots, you're going to see the contact move way more towards the toe. The reason this happens is you can swing out harder when it goes off the toe, when you hit off the toe, and it deadens the hit, the ball's not going to go as far. So think of a shot where there's rough around the green and you need, you, like, you need to fly at a, a really high, like it needs to land high and soft, and it can't roll very far. So you need to take a big swing to get through the rough, but the ball can't go very far, so you need to hit it off the toe. So that pitch shot is pretty cool when you learn how to hit it, where I'm going to get into my good setup. Play. You can see how far off the toe that shot is. That would be perfect for that. So the ball is going to come off nice and dead. It's not going to come off with any ball speed. If I wanted to hit a chip, I'll do the opposite part. And I'm going to hit a low chip shot. Didn't pick that up. I didn't hit it hard enough, fortunately. A low chip. That ball is going to be much more towards the middle of the club face and it's going to come off faster. Sure. With the question came in. It's a good question. When you come down to the ball, you said this before. You don't want to feel like you're digging and driving the leading edge in. Mm -hmm. what, where are you using the bounce of your club uh, coming in? Are you, are you thinking leading edge? Are you thinking bounce? So I'm actually from for, for my personal methods. If the ball is like right on the right where my finger is, what I'm trying to do is I'm actually going to try to hit the ground before the ball. I'm, I have like a, a, a foot window, foot window where I'm trying to. It's like landing an airplane. I have a foot window where I'm trying to get the club to land on the ground. What I never want is to hit it like that. I'm never envisioning a shot like that. I'm actually trying to get the club head to pass where my hands are because I know I'm set up in the right position. So if you measure the sequence of events that happen between the full swing and a wedge, the full swing is very dynamic. I start, I make my downswing, start with my pelvis, I turn my arm into my chest, I'm using my rib cage. That creates this really dynamic impact position. 
when you're hitting a wet shot under 50 yards, the actual, the opposite's happening. The club head and the hands are moving faster and releasing faster than the torso and your belts. So I'm trying to get this to happen in my swing as from, from a good setup. So that creates the same amount of shaffling on dress and what happened at impact. Okay. So, so uh, again, so if a, if a chip is a, if a chip, a low shot, a low shot and a low chip is a left-handed shot, a high pitch is a right-handed shot. So I train players to do both. So a chip is a left-handed finish. The club is never passing, the club is never passing the grip. And a pitch would be a right-handed shot where I'm going to fold my elbow and just hit soft right-handed shots. Can you show the setup again on that chip, chip shot? Chip shot would be the ball is in the middle. Like I'm actually kicking my right hip behind me. My left shoulder goes down, very neutral. And when I'm done, like the club's going to line up right with my left hand. And the front of the nice club is ball. pretty centered, maybe a touch left of center? Correct. For a chip shot, okay. Correct. So the goal would be in terms of how the club is the ground, I'm trying to bruise the ground. I don't want to damage it this way. I'm just trying to bruise it. And so for a pitch, right arm only. And when you're when you're hitting these shots with both hands, right? Mm -hmm. Are you feeling a little more the the left hand controlling the shot on the chip? Absolutely. The right hand so on the that's what I'm going to get into next is like some of the specialty shots. It's like when I want the ball to stop the most. And I'll use a tennis racket here to have this out for an example here. When I want the ball to stop the most, I hit it like a cut shot in tennis, right? And when I want it to release the most, the most, I hit it like a forehand. So I'm, I'm trying to take less loft on the club, hit it this way, so the racket would look like that. So the ball's gonna come off low and tumble that way. If I need to hit a high and soft shot, I'm gonna hit it like a cut shot, like a volley. It wasn't a very good volley this way. Okay, so that's no different than how the club would work in the golf swing. So when I'm trying to hit a distance control, which is I need the ball to come off fast, the club's working like the top spin in the forehand. The ball's gonna come off slower, it's like a cut spin, and the face stays open more. By That's, the way, I'm not a tennis expert, but you're playing the right sport. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so we're gonna hit a high shot again. So my weights, my, my left shoulder's down, my, my stern's in front of the ball, I've got my good setup, the club's gonna go higher than my hands, higher than my hands on the ball group, and I stand up nice and tall. One of the cues that I love to give is I'm trying to put the butt of the club in your left pocket for a right handed golfer when you're done on the high shot. It's like putting the, the, the gun in the holster this way. If you watch, what's happening here is players are trying to get away from tension, right? They're trying to get away from gripping it hard and pulling through. What's actually happening in the swing when they're doing this is their hands are actually coming off the club. So they're taking away tension and grip pressure with it. So they can swing harder again, and the ball is not going to come off as fast. So you're in the fairway, you have to carry a bunker, put the gun in the holster, and then you can see my elbows are nice and soft when I'm done. If I needed to hit a low shot, my finish would be completely different. My arms would be a little bit more firm. They would be a little bit more in front of me this way, controlling the loft of the club, because I want it to come off lower, and I need to, need to take spin off of this way. Higher shot, high finish. Low shot, low finish. So those are some major differences in your waist play. So like my suggestion for you, and I would love for you to practice this the next time out would be create some, create a, a matrix. I call it a wedge matrix. Create a one-to-one, -one, a two-to-two -two and a full with all your wedges. If you're getting really particular with it, get an eight iron and a nine or go all the way through your bag with it. So the length of the swing and the speed of your torso are gonna help control your distance much more than I'm just guessing and I'm, I'm hoping to to hit at a certain distance. With your short game, get your setup right every time. Know the parameters on what's going to make solid contact. Shackling on your short game and chipping and pitching aren't going to create solid contact. I would always get into your good setup, your left shoulder's down, your sternum's in front of the ball. Understand what's going to create solid contact and how that works for you. So those are two really, really big differences in your distance control weapons. Yeah, I mean, a question I have that we get a lot of golf professionals is kind of what what's the right loft increments uh, between wedges? Um, I think, you know, what, where does the pitching wedge start? And you've got four wedges. Uh, you know, what, what are the factors it, there? It starts consider? at the top part of your bag, right? Like if you're hitting, if you're not hitting, if you need a hybrid and a five wood and a seven wood, you don't need four wedges, right? You need a 58 and a 52 and a 46. So it's, some of it depends on how far you hit it. 
most of the time you see pros with four wedges because you know they hit it far enough where they can have four wedges and they can only have they only need one hybrid. Um, I would say the most common thing you would you would see would be um, three three custom wedges like this, a pitching wedge, and then a hybrid, and then um, a three wood. So what you want is to look at the top part of your bag first, not the bottom part of your bag. If that makes sense. And then. So, you, you know, when, when you look at a gap wedge, per se, right, mm -hmm. most of the sets you buy are, are, are four iron or five iron through pitching wedge. Do, do, you, do you get the gap wedge uh, that matches the sand wedge and the, and the lob wedge, wedge? Or, or do you go ahead and grab the, the gap wedge that's part of the set? And what's the difference in those two? So that's a great question. So the ga a gap wedge that comes with the set, those are made for ball speed and distance. Those are very forgiving clubs. Those are not going to spin very much. Um, the gap wedge is the club that spins the most in your bag of any club. It's going to spin the most. When you get it from a set, the ball is going to come up really fast, and it's going to be harder to control your distance. So my suggestion would be, like, check the loft of your club. You can check them all online if you don't have them. They're always on the club manufacturer's um, website. So most some fishing wedges or gap wedges right now are actually 46 degrees. They, the lofts have gone down so much the ball comes off really fast. So make sure you got the right loft. I would say if you like to work the ball, like hit draws and fades and low shots and high shots. Um, you like to hit finesse shots, meaning hold shorter finishes. Get a wedge like like my gap wedge, where it's from like a custom wedge. If you're just trying to hit the same wedge every time, you just want to hit it on the green. Get your gap wedge from the set. That would be a general rule. And if you had a sand, and just uh, change gears a second. If you had a sand, what, what do you hit your normal sand wedge? Full swing. Full swing. Um, I hit like 110 yards. 110. So if you went one to one with a sand wedge, how far would you hit it? Let's see. One to one of the sandwich, it should go somewhere like 65 to 70 yards. I need to practice. So, if my math's right, that's about 75% one to one. One to one. You hit it really heavy, it doesn't count more. <laughs> there you go. That'd be 70 good. yards carried. One to one, 70 oh. yards carried. Mm -hmm. So let's say I had 65 on the course. All I would do is choke up an inch because that's going to take that each inch is going to take off two to three yards. I'd choke up an inch and a half and try to make a one-to-one -one swing. The ball's going to come off a little lower. Maybe shorten my back swing a little bit too much. So one shorter. But I'm trying to keep the length of the swing and the speed constant. Take out as many variables as I can and use my system. So let's we'll see a two to two here. So we're we're at 70 yards there. So two to two. For you is what? There you go, a little longer. Around like 84. Where do I find a swing like that? 91. Pull up there a little bit. So what I need to do with my swing, I need to keep my uh, towel under my arms. I feel like my arms and my body are working more together. Yeah, a little better. slower there, right? A little better. Tempo. That's probably more of my style. And so now, let's see a full, you know, you're, you're going to hit that. The air's a little heavy in the uh, <laughs> indoor deck. But you can see the spin increase when the speed increases. So that was 9,300 RPMs of spin. I, to be fair, I hit it a little off the toe. It's probably why um, the smash factor was a little bit low. The dynamic loft was a little bit high. But very rarely am I hitting full wedges to be, to be spring. Yep. It's about as far as she goes. Yeah, 110, there you go. You know, what I love here is, is you've given the members not just some technique to work on, but um, some strategy, right? And not just go oh, to the range sure. and hit balls. Um, for sure. Pick out some targets, uh, pick out some yardages, track it, use the gun and, to see where it's going. And the way, the, the way your practice should work would be like a game I use all the time is called Goldilocks, where you don't just stand here and try to hit 80 yards all day. You, like the science behind your learning is going to say, if you practice 76 yards to um, 84 yards, you're going to know 80 yards better than someone who just sits there and says 80 yards all day. So if I'm in a typical practice session, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to set up my track man test center. If I'm working on my 2 to 254s, I know it goes 80 to 82 yards. I'm going to say I need to hit this one 75. And then the next one's probably got to go 85. 
but what I'm learning here is I'm learning what's wrong to help me know what's right. So the, the more like information I can give my, my body, the better I'm going to be at calibrating the correct distance. So you don't just sit there and say, I'm just going to hit one-to-ones all day and just master 80 yards, because how often do you have that specific yard? You're always somewhere in the middle. And for someone that's going to work on this, uh, this last question before we go, if someone's going to work on this, should they start with the one-to-ones, work on that? In the I room? always start with a two-to-two. Right? Two -to -two. I went through that a little fast in the beginning there. Right. Um, but I always start with a two-to-two -two wedge because, number one, like pretty easy to hit that solid, right? And the half swing is pretty easy to hit that solid. And then instantly I get them, what, what's going to happen is they're going to start hitting their two-to-two -two farther than their hole. And I'm going to get instant buying because they're like, wow, I don't need to make this big swing hit it far because what happens is the ball rides up the face and, and they don't hit it solid at the bottom. So they take these two to two swings and the club actually times out better and they create better long to impact. And the difference when you're looking at it from one from two to two to full it isn't that you're just That's a little more turn. Down to, yeah. It's a little <laughs> more turn. Well. Yeah. Creates a little more creates a lot more energy. Yeah. Uh, which for you is you know 20, 30 yards. Yeah. Right? And I think the important thing is when you get really good at it, it's like a one-to-one -to, -one to me might even be shorter than a one. It doesn't matter if it's a perfect one. It's whatever it means to me. And so when I get on the golf course and I have those numbers, I'm making these practice swings with the length of my back, and the length of my follow through that are like are an exact replica of what a one-to-one -one would be when I hit. So, so I encourage you, everyone, to go through, um, check out the short game manual. Let me know if you have any questions. I know I went a little fast there on it, but there's some really cool information in there on uh, how to, to get better with your wedges, and we hope to see everyone back out on the course soon.